Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, hmm. I guess how do I start? I greet you all in the love, peace, and grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and as we bow our heads and close our eyes, my prayer is simply this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And to that end, uh, in the form of a question, I submit to you the title of my text. Can I kick it? Can I kick it? As you guys obviously don't know Tribe Call Quest, so we'll move on from there. Uh, my brothers and sisters, there's no place I would rather be on a Sunday morning than in the house of the Lord. I think I share in the sentiment of the psalmist when they say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And there's no greater feeling than hearing that early morning, uh, Sunday morning prayer, reciting that rich, responsive congregational reading, passing the peace to our new and existing members and visitors with a holy hug and kiss, the soulful praise and skillful play of our praise and worship team, and there's no greater feeling than hearing that preached word. A preached word that is delivered with such passion, steeped in prayer, fasting, and study. A preached word that propels us to face the upcoming week in faith and not in fear. There is no place I'd rather be on a Sunday morning. Now, when we consider all those things during the Sunday morning, uh, that's not even my favorite part about the Sunday morning. My favorite part about the Sunday morning worship service has to be the benediction. I'm excited when church is over. Now, Sean, before you send an email to my pastor, let me specify why I say I'm delighted in that. It is not because we've gone over the allotted time for our worship service, nor is it that I am now moments closer to eating brunch with my friends and family, or is it that I am minutes away from watching my Super Bowl champion New England Patriots take the field and defend their title once again. That is not the reason why I'm excited. I'm excited at the end of the service because it is another opportunity for me to listen to our world-renowned Berkeley College of Music musicians play just another song. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you knew these, these, these world-renowned musicians, you would know that at the very end of our service, we have an exit hymn, a farewell song, a benediction song, a sung blessing that sends people back into the world for them to reunite. But what happens after the song is over is something short of amazing. Uh, they take our exit hymn and turn it into a shed or a jam session with these hip hop, funk, uh, gospel, and hip hop and uh, R&B undertones. And on December 10, 2017, this would be a worship experience like no other. Because while our membership was walking across the threshold of our church, there was something that was played in the sanctuary that caused people to turn around. And they encamped around the altar with awe and adorations and their phones out. Because one song was played, but another song was made in the moment. And if you know anything about the Lankford brothers, if you know anything about Mitchell Henry or any of the worship team, this beginning hymn, this exit hymn soon turned into a song, a new song and new voices were heard. And I think that's exactly what the psalmist in this 98th Psalm is trying to get the camp of Israel to do, to sing a new song. You all know Israel, right? Israel, that, that nation that was called to be great. As you look at it in Genesis 12, it was called to be a great nation. This nation that would bless those who would bless them with a God who would curse those who cursed them. A God who promised them this large amount of land in Canaan around Mount Moriah. This land that had a shepherd boy turned into a king in order to acquire the land and build their first temple. That's David. His son Solomon in succession would gather the rest of that land from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That Israel. An Israel that was triumphant in battle, victorious because the Lord was on their side. But this was also 
a transgressing Israel, a divided Israel at the hands of the Assyrians, an exiled uh, Israel at the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. This was Israel. And yet the psalm is here in the 137th Psalm. If you know it and heard it yesterday by our brother Dante, uh, while the captives demanded that in mirth or laughter that they sing a song to Zion, to which the psalmist, unknown to us, responds as a spokesperson to Israel, asks the question, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? This is a question that was uttered, a question that needs answering. And if I'm at liberty to look at this question, I think that this question was asked of the uh, 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 Jewish captives in those Nazi concentration camps. It was a question asked of those slaves on the slave ships and living in slave quarters during the transatlantic slave trade from Africa to the Americas. This was a question that was asked of those in the homes, detention centers, holding cells and the sanctuaries that are being prepared and pursued for deportation. This is a question asked of our brothers of the LGBTQIA community. This question is asked with those who have physical, mental, and cognitive challenges. These are questions asked by our Islamic brothers and sisters. These are questions asked by the Native Americans who find themselves displaced and their land taken from them. These are questions asked by men and women of all ages, and these this is a question asked by us preachers. And if it is not asked, it should be asked by us preachers because we find ourselves sitting among the people by the rivers of Babylon looking for the melodies and notes to play on the harps that hang on the willows. And here it is, we preachers sitting by the rivers of Babylon in an America, I'm talking about America, a, a land that was imagined to be their Zion, a land that was of promise, promise to those who believe in her God and her ideals. We're talking about a, a, a land that has fueled a pilgrimage or a migration for many to this metaphorical land of milk and honey, this refuge, ideally, but for the refugee. But when we really look at it, there are people who are saying, you ought to go back to your land. The question is, how do I sing songs in this foreign land? These are questions that need answers. How can we sing a song in this foreign land? How can we sing a new song? And how can we worship the Lord? Now, I have to be honest here. I don't know if my answer will answer the question. I don't know if the solution is that simple. I don't know if my answer will provide an immediate response, but I think we can invest in some practical steps through the songwriting process. So here are my four points. In order for us to sing a new song, as we worship the Lord, we must first sample one of the saving acts of our Lord. Now, it might be difficult for us to find uh, uh, the presence or presence of God, but yet we must have faith in the character of God that helps us transcend our circumstances. Yeah. We, we have to peer into the past exploits of a God of yesteryear, and in time, it is my hope that it will put us at peace in the present with hope for our forever. Uh, in a time or in this life where lament can turn to laughter and laughter can turn to lament in a moment, we ought to look to the hills and see a living God that we can see in these elements causing us to jump into this celebratory or a uh, 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 beautiful chant or chorus. Mm -hmm. Now, My second point is in order for us to uh, sing a new song as we worship the Lord, we must let our life experience be our lyrical basis. Mm -hmm. Let us consider Israel for a second. There's a great diversity within the narratives that are there. There are a concert of voices that if we are not careful, we will say that some people are celebrating more than the fact that there are more people crying. Some people we believe will be happy and healthy and we overlook or negate or neglect those who are hurting. And yet the celebratory clamor of this crowd should not cause us to miss out on the cries of the helpless and the defenseless. As shepherds to sheep, we as preachers must pair our steps with the flock and participate in their steps in order to give voice and present properly the plight and flight of our flock. 
You see, our true worship is found in the praise of God as we protest and dismantle these systems of oppression. We put aside our privilege and we protect the unprotected as we do the redemptive work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And like the children in Israel or in Ezra, uh, we can't allow our celebration to overlook those who are crying publicly, privately, and silently. Which brings me to my third point. In order for us to sing a new song while we worship the Lord, we must remind the remnant of the Redeemer's promise at the bridge. Now, like Israel, transgressions can cause us to turn our backs on God. Being in exile or an exilic period can cause us to take our eyes off the Lord, but it must be the promises of God that propels us forward. Uh, if you know anything about music, you know the purpose of the bridge is for the singer or the listener to pause and reflect as they prepare for this climactic moment. What does that mean, JT? It means that we as preachers, it is important for us too to pause and reflect on the promises of God, allowing them to minister to us as we minister, minister to those in our membership as we await the climactic or the anticlimactic return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We must remember that we are meeting people at these troubled waters. We are meeting people in the midst of turbulent winds, and we are meeting people on brittle bridges looking for a word, a sign, or a witness. But we too must remember that we serve a God who is, can be, and has proven to be a bridge over troubled waters. We must remember that we serve a God that is a way maker, whether that is a way out or a God who is a way through our situation. And I close with this, my fourth and final point. In order for us to sing a new song and worship as the Lord, worship the Lord, we must declare and dance as if we are at destiny's door. You see, we as preachers are Israel and proclaimers of her God. We are only divided by state lines and bodies of water, yet we are joined together by the grace of God and our call to preach God's word. Like Israel, there are still promises for us to see and for promises to be fulfilled. The saving acts of salvation will always be our sample or starting point. And yet the lyrics of our new song should, be, should come from the times that we have spent in our preaching circles, the stories that we are, or were told while we were breaking bread, and the sermons that we share behind these sacred desks. Now, you may not know who the Lankford brothers are or Mitchell Henry, or my praise and worship team at Morning Star Baptist Church in Mattapan, Massachusetts, 1257 Blue Hill Ave. Mattapan, uh, we have an 8 and 11 o'clock service, shameless plug. But you may not know the new voices that came during that worship moment, like Stephanie Jones, Matthew Borders IV, who I call Chanel, and Elijah Juan Davis, who has preached at this conference. They were expressing themselves through song and rhyme to the glory of the Lord on this December 10th, 2017. But you have an opportunity to kick it like the Tribe Called Quest says and sing a new song. Because while Moses in Exodus chapter 15 verse 2 says that the Lord is my strength and my song and the prophet Isaiah is calling to the mountains of Israel in restoration for them to burst into song, there was a song standing by the uh, shores by the Jordan River waiting to be sung. You see, that river would clap his hands as Jesus would be baptized by his cousin John. The life of Jesus was like a sounding trumpet calling people, including his disciples, to assemble by mountainsides, to assemble by the seashores, and in the midst of storms at the sea, to hear and to turn or repent to hear the great truth of the Lord. In that same breath, Jesus would serve as a trumpeter's warning of the upcoming end time times and his subsequent death and with that old rugged cross on his back in a sorrowful moment the mountain of Calvary would sing for joy his commitment to death by crucifying by crucifixion 
would reunite all human mankind with God once and for all. And with nails in his hands and feet, with the spear wound to his side, Jesus would sound the shofar or the ram's horn of his heart in a painful pitch asking, like it says in the 22nd Psalm, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But yet with the breath remaining in his body, he says it is finished. The prophets and leaders of old have sung their song. But to you, AOP, my, my preaching friends, my brothers and sisters, my co-laborers, my question to you is, do you have enough evidence of a living God to sing a new song? Thank you. <laughs>